Welcome, Ogar uh, attendees to Dallas, Texas, and this uh, great conference that you're having regarding the history of Tejanos and Mexican Americans uh, throughout the United States. It's a privilege and an honor to uh, tell you a little bit about my life story, which is really an American story. Uh, and it's so American, it's as American as ap uh, apple pie, pecan pie, enchiladas, and tacos and fajitas. Is that Texan? Uh, let me just tell you, my, my story on my father's side starts uh, with Donicio Garcia, uh, who was uh, grown in, uh, grew up in a small town named Morelos, Coahuila, Mexico, which at that time was called Coahuila, Texas, and Saltillo was the capital of that area back in the early 1800s before 1835. After the Texas Revolution uh, and the Mexican-American War, the Garcia family wound up being on the other side of Coahuila of the Rio Grande, about 50 miles across the border from Eagle Pass, Texas. Uh, there, Este Donesio became the first mayor, uh, one of the first mayors of Morelos, Coahuila, Mexico. Uh, during the Mexican-American Revolution in the early 1900s, his son, Filiberto Garcia, my great-grandfather, uh, fled uh, Mexico and came to Dallas, Texas. Uh, he uh, grew up uh, in the west side of Dallas, area called Ledbetter Eagle Fort, where he was a barber, uh, and um, married an Anglo woman here in Dallas, Texas. Uh, he wound up being uh, most famous, I guess, as the barber for Clyde Barrow, uh, Bo Bonnie and Clyde fame, and also for many Mexican Americans out there. He also was the first and only Mexican American buried at Greenwood Cemetery, and you'll see his tombstone. Uh, at, back in that time period, back in the 1940s, Dallas was very segregated. And so in Greenwood Cemetery, there will be no blacks, no Mexican Americans, no Jews, and no Catholics. Only white Protestants were allowed to be buried at that time. Uh, however, my great-grandfather, Filiberto Garcia, was buried because of some extra work done by his wife and the fact that he was a semi-prominent member of Dallas Society at the time. Uh, then uh, his son, Domingo Garcia, my grandfather, I was actually born in Mexico, in Morelos, Coahuila, and grew up and became a rancher in Mexico, uh, where he had a small ranch and uh, was uh, in that part of the business. Uh, Domingo Garcia had a son, Alberto Garcia. Alberto Garcia uh, is my father. Uh, when he was 17, he decided he wanted to try his luck on the other side of the border, so he swam across the Rio Grande with four friends, walked for 17 days through the West Texas desert till he found a ranch. Uh, near uh, what is now Van Horn, Texas, uh, where he worked for $40 a month. He then met my mother, Manuela Garcia, got married, uh, moved to Midland. I was born in Midland, Texas, uh, during the oil booms. And then my father eventually became, uh, we worked the fields in West Texas as farm workers. And then my father eventually moved to Dallas, which is a booming town, in the 1967, uh, and uh, brought the family here. And uh, I'm the oldest of seven, and my father, uh, who just passed away this year, uh, uh, became a fairly successful concrete contractor uh, with seven children. Uh, on my mother's side, uh, the story starts with Apacheria. Apacheria was uh, the area which is now basically West Texas, New Mexico, Arizona, Chihuahua, and Sonora. My mother's 100% Apache. Uh, they come from the Mascalero Apache tribe, uh, which was dominant in West Texas and, and Southern New Mexico and Chihuahua. Um, the story goes back to uh, the 1880s uh, when my great uncles, uh, Victorio and Geronimo, uh, were the last Native Americans who put up resistance against the European invasion of the Americas. Uh, in the 1880s, uh, Geronimo was captured and the entire tribe uh, that he was with was sent to Fort uh, Marion in Florida where they became prisoners of war for almost 22 years before they were sent to Fort Till, Oklahoma where Geronimo died. He was my great uncle. Uh, Victorio, who was another great uncle, and Pedro Cano, who was my great grandfather, uh, were able to escape the U.S. Army. They had a battle at Rattlesnake Springs, Texas, uh, which was the last battle uh, on American soil between Native Americans and European soldiers. The European soldiers, by the way, were led by the Buffalo Soldiers. And if anybody ever saw Buffalo Soldiers with Danny Glover, uh, that battle is actually recreated in that scene. Uh, Victorio was able to escape into Mexico. Unfortunately, they run into a Mexican ambush with the Mexican army. Uh, Victorio is killed. The survivors create a town called Porvenir, Texas, and that's where my great grandfather Pedro Cano uh, and my great grand and my grandmother Catalina Cano are raised. And they have a pretty peaceful, quiet settlement as they take off their Apache garb uh, and basically uh, become Mexican peons, uh, working as ranchers and farmers there in Porvenir, Texas, a very isolated part of Texas, about 90 miles south of El Paso on the Rio Grande. 
on January 25th, 1918, um, uh, Chico Cano, who's my great uncle, uh, his ranch was wanted by Anglos who were now moving into this area of West Texas. He refused to sell his ranch uh, to the Mr. Bright, who was a big rancher there. As a result, uh, Mr. Bright sent uh, a couple of Anglo cowboys to Chico's uh, ranch. They killed two of the vaqueros They were there. They raped his wife, killed his wife, burned his ranch, killed his cows. As a result of that, uh, my great-grandfather, Pedro Cano, Chico Cano, my great-uncle, and a couple of other cousins went to the Bright Ranch. Um, and there they found an Anglo postman, hung him, uh, and wound up killing a couple of other Anglos there, uh, and wound up taking his cows and burning his ranch. That was sort of a tit for tat, wild, wild west. The result of that was Governor Hobby, if anybody's been to Houston Hobby Airport, uh, was the governor of Texas at that time. He then sends the Texas Rangers from Austin to deal with Mexican bandits. Any Tejanos who resisted were also always called bandits in the 18 and 1900s. It's sort of uh, the shiny object that police officers say they see in somebody's hands when they kill an unarmed black or African American or Latino uh, person. Uh, the Rangers arrive um, on January 25th to Port Venir, Texas, a small village, all American citizens. Uh, they line up all the men between the ages boys, 12 to uh, 72, tie their hands behind their back and shoot them in the back. It's one of the biggest mass murders uh, in American history. It's very uh, unknown. Uh, my grandmother, uh, who was a child at that time, fled across the river along with all the other women and children. But there was an investigation by the only state rep in uh, Texas, uh, Mexican American at the time, JT Canales, uh, and an Anglo school teacher who taught at Puerto Rico School. And as a result of that, there's now a movie uh, Puerto Rico, Texas has aired in PBS this week, and which you can see, and you'll see a small clip of that, of that tragic history uh, there. As a result of the Puerto Rico massacre, Chico Cano and Pedro Cano uh, came back, um, and they killed a couple of Texas Rangers. Uh, Sutton, Ranger Sutton is in the Waco, Texas Museum of, of uh, Ranger History as a hero. Uh, they were cold-blooded killers. Uh, anybody who knows uh, the Ranger history knows about that history. Um, and eventually, Chico Cano and Pedro Cano wound up losing their land in Texas. Uh, they had to go to Mexico to uh, hide from the U.S. Cavalry, which under General Pershing uh, came down to Porvenir. And eventually Chico Cano and Pedro Cano joined Pancho Villa, part of the Mexican Revolution, and wound up uh, on the other side of the border of a bunch of the early 1900s. My mother, uh, my grandmother, Catalina Garcia, um, lived there in Porvenir, Mexico, which is right across the river where Porvenir, Texas used to be. And then um, my mother, uh, Manuela Garcia, uh, was also born in Porvenir. She was a citizen by Apache birth, uh, married my father when she was 17, uh, and people who had been ranchers and farmers, we became farm workers working in the cotton fields of West Texas uh, until we moved to Dallas. Uh, and my mother continues to um, talk about our history. And again, it's an American history. Uh, it's filled with tragedy, filled with uh, also uh, a lot of victories. Uh, uh, I was born in Midland, Texas, came to Dallas when I was uh, nine years old, watched the first Cowboys Packers games, Ice Bowl in 1967. Uh, got hooked on football and became a Cowboy fan ever since. Uh, graduated from the Dallas Public Schools, uh, went to the University of North Texas, paid my way through school, uh, and then to Texas Southern University. I uh, became the first uh, and youngest Dallas City Council member under the 14-1 City Council District in 1991. Uh, we helped uh, create the Latino Cultural Center through a bond package that eventually my wife, who became a city councilwoman, helped uh, fund. Um, then as a state, I was elected to the Texas House in 1996, where my proudest achievement was passing House Bill 14OT, the Texas Dream Act, which allowed now more than three million dreamers to achieve the American dream by going to college and finishing their career. And on April uh, 9th, 2006, we had the largest civil rights march of Latinos in the United States and one of the largest civil rights marriages in the history of the United States uh, here in Dallas, Texas, when over 500,000 Latinos marched for immigration rights. So we continue, uh, and now we have two sons, Fernando and Joaquin, and that family tradition of the Ivankovichis and the Garcias continues, just like your history of all the EZs that are out there, the Sanchez, Rodriguez, and Lopez, or the Gomez's and the Garcias. So uh, thank you for joining us and hearing our little brief history of uh, the Garcias and the Ivankovichis here in Texas.